Do you have clients that trigger you? You know that's about you, right? And parts that beat you up for it, while others take you out in session, so you feel stuck. You are not alone, or at least you don't have to be. Join the six-session bi-weekly online internal family systems consult group. Get clarity. Reclaim your self-leadership. Enjoy your work again. Serve your clients better. IFSCA.ca. Go to the supervision tab for more info or to sign up. Way in the back. Do you ever do this in a group? Uh, yes, we do a lot of group work with this. I can talk about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so if we get to do a demo where you get to see a session, uh, one way to work is to do that with one member of the group while everybody witnesses that work. And what you'll find is that as they're watching the work, they're working with their own parts that are similar to the work that the client's doing. So it's very efficient because people are doing a lot of work at once. And then the discussion afterwards the client feels so witnessed and so held and so accepted, especially when they're working with parts they're so ashamed of, uh, that the power of the group has that magnifies the healing effect. And the self-energy the clients feel from the group while they're doing it really helps me access self very quickly. Which is why if we do a demo, we can go places we couldn't probably one-on-one -on -one because there'd be all this self-energy coming toward the person. What's another way to work with groups? Another way, we do a lot of uh, psychodramatic kind of stuff with, with groups. So you could have somebody come in the middle and pick people in the group to play their parts and do a kind of role reverse around it. Yes? Yeah, I mean, usually they won't until what they protect has been healed. But you can try it. Um, so typically, we'll just say, you know, I get you're going to have to do what you do until we fix what you're trying to protect, rather than negotiate those kinds of changes. Yeah. When you get to the the, the exiles and, and you're into the process of working through now the healing part of the process. What are some of the things you do around the healing? Yeah, so let me get to that and then we'll start the demo. So I'm going to run through the healing steps really quickly. So you get permission from, and, and we now know how to negotiate with protectors around the common fears they have. We, we now know how to get permission from protectors. We know all their common fears. We know how to address their fears. Sometimes it takes a while. <clears throat> Once we get permission, then focus on this sadness, or focus on this worthlessness, or this terror. Find it in your body, around your body. How do you feel toward it? Sometimes there's a lot of fear of it. There's a lot of anger at it or something. Get all that to step back until the client feels some, at least curiosity. Often we can get clients to a point of compassion, because they sense it's young and vulnerable. Okay, let it know if you feel that way, and we'll do that. And I'll often say, how close are you to this little girl in there? People can usually tell you exactly how close they are to it. Could you get closer? Could you show it that you care about it somehow? And we'll do that until the part uh, feels connected and trusts the self, which can take some time. A lot of these exiles are furious itself for being locked up or for not protecting them when it happened originally. So sometimes there's got to be a repair. It has to be, self has to apologize and so on. At that point, when there's a trusting relationship between the self and the part, we know it's safe to begin the actual healing process, which involves three, three main steps. The first of which is what we call witnessing, where you would say to your part, uh, I would say to the client, 
ask the part to show you what happened when it got these beliefs and emotions in the past. There's some version of that. And clients start to see scenes, but they also start to feel a lot. They start to um, have sensations. And if it feels like it's too much, like overwhelming, ask the part to not totally overwhelm you so that you can be with it but not become it. And you'll be amazed at how that works. No grounding skills needed. <clears throat> and then uh, we'll do that until the part feels fully witnessed. So I'll keep saying, is there more? Just make sure. Just check and see if it needs you to know more. When the part feels fully witnessed, starts what we call the retrieval. I'd like you to go into that scene or that time period and be with that little girl in the way she needed at the time. You're in there with her. Do what's needed back there. Sometimes she needs you to push away the abuser. Sometimes she needs you to just hold her. If necessary, I'll come in too. Do that until <coughs> part feels like what needed to happen back there has happened, or sometimes they're just ready to leave. Then let's take her to a safe, comfortable place. Could be the present, could be a fantasy place. Another time in your life that was safe. Okay, so um, you do the retrieval. Now the part's in a safe, comfortable place. Most exiles at that point are willing to let go of what they've been carrying, even though they've been carrying it for 30 years. So then you ask, ask the part of it to be willing to unload the emotions and beliefs it got from that time. If it says yes, we have a little bit of a you know, ritualistic, what, what does it want to give it up to? Light, water, fire, wind, or anything else. And it sends it out through one of those, and these things are now expelled from the system. And the part feels much lighter, feels much better, and often feels empty, though. Burdens took up a lot of space. So invite, tell the part to invite into its body qualities it'll need in the future. So stuff comes back in, feels much better. What's it want to do? It just wants to play. Now let's invite in all the protectors of it to see that it doesn't need their services anymore so they can think about new jobs. So we bring in all those protectors. If we have time, we'll work with them. They need to unburden, they're stuck back there too. Do whatever they need so they can take on the new role. So that's the process basically, and then we're off to the next exile. Okay, yeah, one question, then we're gonna to jump to the video. Sorry, so you have the missing and then retrieval, and then is there a name for that third one, or is it just the? Uh, the invitation is inviting qualities in. Okay, and then the integration is bringing in the parts at the end. So, so this is, uh, this is a, a guy who's uh, done a lot of IFS. He's been my client sporadically. You know, he'll call me every so often to do some work. Uh, has a horrible, horrible trauma history. He's come a long way. Ritual abuse, a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, would probably be, a, be, when we started, be diagnosed as uh, borderline personality, which I hate because it scares the hell out of therapists. So what you'll find is that every DSM category is just a description of the kinds of protectors that were needed to protect them in the past and are still doing it. But DSM just totally pathologizes them. So anyway. So I love this video for a number of reasons. One of which is it shows that these protectors aren't what they seem at all. And that they often are kids themselves who got forced like in uh, uh, Lord of the Flies, you know, like had to be the warriors. But they've got a lot of vulnerability themselves. And we often gloss over them and try to get to the exile. And that, uh, that statement the part made of, you try to go for a caring and you get hurt worse and you're trapped and there's no turning. And of course, you get this conclusion, it's a burden. I don't belong with people, I just gotta... And like I've worked a lot with offenders, people that committed big crimes. They've got the same damn part. 
Only they weren't successful in getting it exiled, did not hurt people. It's basically the same part. And it's got a story, and it's got a right to be loved, like everybody else. And people vilify these rage parts, because they can be so scary. I mean, that's the other thing I like about this, because it so clearly shows that simply by getting parts that are terrified of this one, or hate it, so you want to get rid of it, just negotiating with them to step back, how do you feel toward it now? You get more and more self. I'm getting more and more so, to the point where now he feels compassionate toward it, can go sit with it, be with it. Yeah? Do you ever find it helpful to um, move the um, protector away a little bit, 10 feet away so it doesn't get blended with self? Yeah, sometimes that's what we're doing. We're asking him to step back. I thought he was right next to him. Oh, oh, oh I see what you mean. We didn't need to do that because he was willing to let self be there without... Yeah. Yes, so this is a firefighter, but we're starting, he said, I'm a vulnerable part too. And later he'll say how hurt he was that we just kind of bypass him all the time and work with these others. So he's kind of pleading for us to work with him, so we're going to wind up doing that. Yeah. And every time, and every time um, when you ask in the beginning in regards to how you feel towards him, and he come back with something negative, that was a part that you asked. It's always a part. Until you got the self. So when I ask that question, I'm learning about the parts that are polarized with this one. So with, with an extreme firefighter like this, there's always a bunch of managers that hate it and want to get rid of it. So I'm asking them to step back. So we can get to know it, and maybe even help it not have to do this. That's my sales pitch. Yeah. And when you're asking them to step back, um, do they just know how to? They seem to know what I'm talking about. But you know, if they, what do you mean step back? I'll say, just separate a little bit, open a little space for him. There's lots of phrases you can use for him. Yeah. yeah. As an observer, it can be a bit hard to tell which part is talking, which part you're referring to. Do you ever name the parts? If the client wants to name them, we'll do that, sure. I've been doing this so long, I know yeah. who's who. But yeah, it helps to have a scorecard if you're, uh, if you're new to it. But really, so far, it's just been this rage part and then all the parts that are polarized with it. So I've gotten to step back. You also heard me at some point say, he can't hurt you if you're not afraid of him. Yes, yeah, yeah. As a reassurance to the fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that turns out to be one of these laws of inner physics. I just wrote a chapter for the second edition of the original book called The Laws of Inner Physics and how they were different and similar to our laws of inner physics, of outer physics. And that's one of those laws. If you can get a client self, there's nothing inside of them that has any power. Yeah. When you let the managers know you'd like to have them step back so you can perhaps help them not to go into this rage part, does that sometimes activate the rage part even more because it feels like you're trying to get rid of it or change it? As long as the rage part trusts that we're getting them to step back in the service of getting to know it, no, it calms it down. Yeah. What was the question? I'm sorry, yeah. Um, when I'm working with one, like a rage part, and I ask the others to step back, does that enra enrage the rage part more? Uh, no, be, uh, when you give the explanation that you want oh, to Oh, that I want to change, change it. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. They don't like that right. idea. No. But they also see the virtue in getting those parts to step back, so most of the time they'll go with that. It's like doing family therapy. It totally. This is inner family therapy. It's yeah. what it is. It's exactly what Bear it is. Bear with me. Bear with me, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, I noticed that every time you thought that he seemed to connect with himself, himself, right before he would take his breath and settle. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if you if you notice like that there are those kinds of somatic markers. Yes, you do. Yeah. Self has a certain way of sitting usually and breathing and and so on. <laughs> so you can kinda of go by that too as you go. Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, so, um, so I say there are these two different modes, direct access and what we call insight, which is where the client self is working with the part and I'm talking to the client self. And I'll go back, with some clients, I'll go back and forth between those a lot. Partly, and there's like four common reasons that you go to direct access. <coughs> um, one of which was in the beginning, where you don't have a choice really, because that part wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So then I said, let me talk to it and I'll form a, a connected relationship. And again, one of the, the second reason is when there's a part that doesn't trust you, doesn't trust anybody, it's much better for me to form a personal connected relationship with the part. And then there's a couple other reasons, but uh, I'll shift back and forth a lot between those two modes. And it's very simple. Let me talk to the part directly. Just let it speak through your mouth. Don't censor. You know, you can see he was censoring in the beginning, and then finally the part blasted me. Uh, and then, uh, and, and then when you shift back, the part will say, okay, and we'll step, step out. And then I'll immediately ask, how do you feel now? Having heard all this, how do you feel toward the part? And the time I spent in direct access, self and the other parts are watching that. And because the part's giving me a lot, they now have a different attitude toward it. So that's another of the four reasons to go to a, a, a direct access. When there's a lot of fear of a part, and it would take a lot to get the fear to step back, I'll talk to it directly until they see that it's not what they thought. Yeah, I'm sorry, the question was these somatic markers we're talking about, and there are a handful of them. I, everybody's got different ones. I can notice when I'm in self by, I'll check, is my heart open? I'll check, do I have an agenda? I'll check, um, tone of my voice, I'm very auditory. So I'm noticing that all the time. And when his, when I was getting ready to talk to his protector, I was doing a lot of work with my parts. But just let me handle this. You don't have to jump in here. Just let me stay. And you can say, I stayed in self pretty well. I was calm. And, and the part, if it senses your fear, or it senses you, then it gets stronger. So, but yes, that's uh, down the road, when I, I'm sure it wouldn't trigger him to, to become self-conscious about it, then we'll talk about it. This is yourself. This is what it feels like. I can go with that. Yeah. Okay. Same question. Uh, I guess all of us here in New York as well have uh, the limited time sessions for the initial work. Why did you start the process there? And I guess yeah. it will take an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, what do you do there? And then uh, probably, I don't know, when you start it, how do you do it? Without, uh, the show without yeah. So, uh, you know, we all are limited. Um, most, many IFS therapists have gone to 60 minutes because 45, 50 minutes takes that long just to get permission with the protectors and then you're out of time. So I do full 60 minutes. If, uh, if I need to, I'll make the next client wait a little while if I have to go over. Um, and, though, it's possible to stop between each of those stages and say, we're going to stop here, we're going to freeze it, and we'll pick up right here next time. So I'm looking at the clock. Do I really have time to do the witnessing? Well, maybe not. Okay, so... I said, okay, we're going to pause it, and I want you to just check in with that, that part every day until I, we meet again, but then we'll take it and, and do the rest. So, and usually the clients? Usually they can. Sometimes the protector sees the opportunity, and, yeah. and they come back in, and then you've got to work with them again. But more often, people can do that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I, I'm open to questions and reactions about the video for now, so. Oh, I was just going to ask about the breadth of the model, whether it could be used for direct <coughs> service workers, so we've been talking about psychotherapy, but I can imagine on a crisis line mm -hmm. or um, in a shelter mm -hmm. that these concepts would fit, but it's not psychotherapy, it would be 
identifying the you know, polarization of the conflict. So is there? Yeah, so we're, we're bringing this to lots of other fields. I actively, we have an active training program for mediators and conflict resolution people. And they're, some of them are doing a big time international conflict resolution work. And uh, we're bringing it to education. There's a couple initiatives to teach this to kids so that rather when they get bullied, they don't lock up their hurt, they go to it and embrace it. And uh, there's initiatives in the spirituality world. And, uh, and, so, and so, yes, uh, we're very interested in bringing it to different populations, you know, with different applications. So we're not necessarily going to train in uh, November and bring it to China where they don't have therapists. And so we're going to teach how to work with protectors, get to know some exiles, but not actually work with exiles. So we're trying to adapt it to different kinds of populations. Yeah. I have a question about as a therapist. So when I watched that, I was deeply moved. And when you said to him, I can understand why you would do that. I can understand why that seven-year-old, it felt completely right that you would say that. Do you, as a therapist, need to feel that? Because that, what I wondered was whether it can start to sound wrote to the client. Yeah, yeah. Just, you, know, you just say that. Yeah. You always say, of course I understand that. Yeah. You need to stay very present. To yes. The That's right. Yeah. That's a good question because uh, clients have these incredibly sensitive parts detectors. So they know when you're really being authentic and when you're not. Now if I'm in self, I can say it, even if I never had an experience like that, I can say I really get that because self has that Compassion capacity is just natural, and people feel it. But if I were to say it from a part who's just trying to get through the session, uh, they, they would tell, and, and it wouldn't have the proper impact and fight, probably bring back their protector. So that's partly why we're constantly, I don't know if I said this, but if you had a microphone in my head, uh, during that session, you'd just hear, I'd notice a bunch of parts, and just step back, just trust me, just let me stay throughout the session. And I might feel my heart close and then suddenly it's open again. So, yeah. Yes? I'd like to know, for, for somebody on my level of knowledge, how would they be able to discern what they're processing for the client and where I may slide into re-traumatizing the client? Yeah. So what, what re-traumatizes clients? is exiles taking over and being overwhelmed and blended with those parts. So, uh, probably 20 years ago, I stumbled out of this discovery that parts can control how much they overwhelm. So, so we're monitoring that and we're having the client tell us, is this okay or is this too much? And if he says it's too much, so ask the part to just slow it down and and pull out a little bit. We're going to stay with it until it feels fully witnessed, but see if it would just not overwhelm you this much. And they will do that. So that's how you avoid the re-traumatizing. Uh, I don't know who's next. Go ahead. Yes. So this part has been flying ever since. He's still doing great. But um, there are times when you'll go back and the part's stuck back in the same place and it's carrying the same stuff. And I used to get very discouraged and think, oh, this didn't work. And then I got curious. And asking why they came back and all that. There are four common reasons that burdens return. Uh, and it's always one of those four. The most common reason is that, I, had, I didn't mention this, but there's a big important step after the session where on a daily basis for three weeks to a month, 
the client checks in with the park. Okay, so make sure that he's flying or just doing okay if he needs anything. And if you don't, not always, but if you sometimes if you don't follow up that way, then the parts feel abandoned and they go back. Uh, second common reason is you didn't get the whole story, and the part's going to take you back there until you get everything. Third common reason is unburdening this part made it very difficult for other protectors to do their jobs, because they were relying on pushing that button to control you. And now they're freaking out. And so they brought it back. And then the fourth one, oh yeah, um, something scary happened during the week after the unburdening. And the system has a kind of um, belief that it was related to bringing this vulnerability into the present. And so then they throw it back. It's always one of those four. And so we go in, okay, what happened? Why is it back? Okay, and then we go fix that, and now this time it sticks. So almost always, if you did follow up for a month or so, um, the part now trusts your connection to it, and it, it will stay unburdened. Yeah. yeah, I'll repeat. So could it be harmful in doing an intake to just yank this information out about their backgrounds and what happened to them in the past? And yes, you can be prematurely accessing exiles, just like I was talking about. And I also have that critique of exposure therapy, which is the most common trauma therapy. It's for me, it can be torture for clients because you're forcing them to, to bring forth their exiles before they're, they're ready for it, which is why in the outcome studies they do, they have 60% dropout rates. So, yeah, right here. Yeah. Why is that How does it manifest? Sometimes it's a physical reaction. I understand there's some physicians here, so I can talk a little about uh, IFS and medical kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's, it, it just varies. There's, and it doesn't always happen, but if you, so we know about the HCs, and I like alliteration, so we also have the five Ps. Patience, persistence, which is a great combination. Perspective, playfulness, and presence. presence. So, the reason I bring this up is perspective, and what we mean by that is the IFS perspective. So if a client comes in and they're ha they've, had, they've got some kind of spiking and some kind of scary symptom, you don't think, oh my god, you think, oh, okay, there's a part that got triggered by our last session. Let's go find it and see what happened. And lo and behold, it's, you know, it's scared because you went to places that scare the shit out of it. And it wasn't, you didn't check with it before you got there. And even when you do all your upfront homework and you ask protectors, is there anybody who's going to object to this or backlash if we do this? Sometimes they just hang back and they don't come forward and then they backlash. So, but it's so crucial. It's, it's, this reframes everything. So all the things that in traditional trauma work are thought of as pathological, psychological processes, so what would those be? Dissociation, flashbacks, suicide, avoidance, huh? Re-experiencing, numbing, psychosis, voices. What's that? Yeah, emotional regulation. All of this is just the activities of protectors. It's not pathology. And when you get that, you have that big P word perspective. You don't overreact. You can be very calm, even though your client is scared to death. You're calm, oh, it's just a part, let's go find it. Let's go see what it's about. So it really changes your whole perspective. It's a totally radically different paradigm. Yes, way in the back.
warrior role. Yeah. A warrior Exactly. Right? Mm-hmm. And so we've sidestepped him, thinking that we've asked him permission all these years of doing therapy with him. Um, but really, what he was, <coughs> is, he, is he an exile? No, he's people? not. He's a protector. But what this illustrates so dramatically is these protectors are just little kids who, in that same scene, had to be the ones to deal with the abuser and had to come forward that way to take the bullet. And they're young and vulnerable, but they can't allow themselves to be that way. Oh, well, they're young protectors. Young protectors. So my brain was saying, is this a blending of a protector and no. an exile? Oh my god. No. <laughs> this was straight protector. We had see, the protector was very upset that we kept bypassing him. But my contention is that, and I didn't say this down, that had we not healed those other parts that protected it would never have submitted to this. So all that work was really necessary before we could actually do this. He wouldn't have accessed his desire to be engaged That's right. if the other work hadn't been done. Yes. So it's layered. It's layered. That's right. So um, anyway, ultimately it looks like a little vulnerable kid because he was at the time when he was seven. But that kid had to step forward and take the bullet, like I said. And I find this over and over with offenders, rapists, all these people, you get in there and when they were being traumatized when they were young, the offending part took the bullet for everybody else, now carries the energy of the abuser, was using that energy to combat the abuser, but is stuck with it. And part of that energy is to dominate, to hurt vulnerability. Donald Trump has it in spades. To have no caring about anything other than uh, power and winning. And so once you get that, it changes everything in how you understand rapists or uh, what are they called, white white supremacists or they're just dominated by these kinds of protectors. So when you're a little kid and There's a a perpetrator abusing you. Uh, You feel totally powerless, desperate for power. And parts of you start looking around the room. Who has power in this room? It's this guy who's doing this to me. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to take in his energy to combat him. And virtually anybody who's been abused that way has a part that did that. And again, whether or not they offend in the, down the road just has to do with how their system dealt with that part. Not a question of whether they have it or not. So you're saying that it's internalized? Yes. So the energy of the abuser is now being used, initially used to protect but now becomes um, toxic. The, it, the part still carries it, stuck back in that scene, so it thinks it still needs it, and then acts out of that energy because it's just natural. So, Ken? There's a constraint on the self because of that trauma. Constraint on the self is this part that now automatically reacts and also has desires to hurt vulnerability. So, unburdening that part frees it up. Yeah? You made the comment, sorry, but they say that they themselves offend down the road, that energy sort of has to behavior. What's that kind of contingent on? What's that? What's that contingent on? On whether or not they offend down the road? How much they've managed to exile that part? You heard the part himself didn't want to do it and just decided and it was really resentful that he keeps getting called back out as we work with the exile. And so he just decided, I'm, I love the line he said, it was very moving to me. Um, I don't belong with humans or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go back up the mountain. Go back up the mountain. So he himself didn't want to do it. He knew he couldn't control himself. 
Most, many people have them locked in jails. I have a video from the MDMA. Uh, if we have time, I'll show it. It's only like 10 minutes. Where you have this uh, Iraqi vet who uh, takes the drug and spontaneously, and this is with no cueing from the therapist, says, uh, you know, I, I can see that I've got my rage locked in jail inside of me. And I think it was a mistake, because I, I got so scared by what he did in Iraq, and ever since then I've been scared. I'm going to open the door and let him out. This is totally spontaneous. They didn't cue anything about IFS or anything. So if you want, I can show you that video. It was, that was so confirming, because they had this, like Derek said, 70-some percent of the time, they take the drug, it accesses a lot of self, and spontaneously they begin doing IFS. MDMA. MDMA, which is ecstasy on the street. So, yeah, way in the back. Now it was all the same part. Which part was the, the aggressive, protective, angry part. Yeah, he was saying we bypassed him for years, trying to get to these vulnerable parts. He protected. Did the fear part ever feel that way? The helpless part? Uh, yeah, sometimes. If it's a protector, we typically go to them, schmooze with them, but then try to get to the exiles. Uh, so we, you know, so a lot of those parts ultimately start to feel that way. Yeah. So um, the, the comment is, uh, sometimes I would just ask these interfering parts to step back, and other times I might have to talk to them. So the main criteria is, is this part, if I don't talk to it, is this part going to continue to interfere? So if that's true, then I'll, I'll stop moving toward whatever part we're working with initially, and then move toward the interfering part, and it becomes the target part for a while. I might even have to do a whole unburdening with it and then come back to the original target part. So this is sort of a Taoist in the sense that you go with the flow of the system. You never, like resistance isn't a concept in this work. Because you get blocked and you go to the block in a loving way and you get to know it and you honor it and then you heal it and now it's not blocking anymore and then you go back. So, so one of the other things I like about this video is it demonstrates how Parts have parts, and parts have self. And if I go any further down, your heads will explode and I'll blood all over your mouth. <laughs>sometimes feel like you're not good enough. Most people do and find a whole bunch of ways to try to manage it or distract from it. But what if these were all just parts of you? And what if the part that feels badly just wants you to hear it so it can unload its story and the others can relax? Say hello to your internal family. www.ifsca.ca